We back. <laughs> yeah, we back. Back to back years. Grifties right here, 2021. The often imitated, never duplicated, the greatest award show on earth, the Grifties. Did you miss us? <laughs> I, I, I love being back. I love being in this role. Ladies and gentlemen, Grifties is coming soon. Subscribe, like, share. We're coming at you soon. We back. <laughs> yeah, we back. Back to back years. Grifties right here, 2021. The often imitated, never duplicated, the greatest award show on earth, the Grifties. Did you miss us? <laughs> I, I, I love being back. I love being in this role. Ladies and gentlemen, Grifties is coming soon. Subscribe, like, share. We're coming at you soon. We back. <laughs> yeah, we back. Back to back years. Grifties right here, 2021. The often imitated, never duplicated, the greatest award show on earth, the Grifties. Did you miss us? <laughs> I, I, I love being back. I love being in this role. Ladies and gentlemen, Grifties is coming soon. Subscribe, like, share. We're coming at you soon. We back. <laughs> yeah, we back. Back to back years. Grifties right here, 2021. The often imitated, never duplicated, the greatest award show on earth, the Grifties. Did you miss us? <laughs> I, I, I love being back. I love being in this role. Ladies and gentlemen, Grifties is coming soon. Subscribe, like, share. We're coming at you soon. We back. <laughs> yeah, we back. Back to back years. Grifties right here, 2021. The often imitated, never duplicated, the greatest award show on earth, the Grifties. Did you miss us? <laughs> I, I, I love being back. I love being in this role. Ladies and gentlemen, Grifties is coming soon. Subscribe, like, share. What's up, people? Otep Jesus, we are back. One, two, one, two. Damn, I forgot to upload the new sounds already. Anyway, I am that hotep Jesus do. That ho that ho that ho that ho tep that ho tep that 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 ho tep Jesus dude. Got a wonderful presentation for you today. We're gonna learn a lot, as always. But uh before we get into the presentation, as you already know, we got a time stamp. Adam Rizek, what's up, bro? Adam Rizek is in the chat, creator of the Grifties app, grifties.com. Make sure you go vote. Grifties are going to air this Thursday, so make sure you look out for that. Um, let's see. Uh, let me go ahead and put this. Oh, I did the promo already. Okay, it's out there, right? I think I did that already. I didn't. No, I didn't. Shit, it's in another window. Fuck, hold on. Boom, 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 boom. Damn, I had it. Where is it? Oh, there it is. The government robbed Americans of their labor in 1873. Let's discuss this crime against humanity. That tweet is now in the world. Please go retweet. Share this out with your friends and families. Uh, tag me on Twitter. I will retweet you. Greatly appreciate it. All right, let's, uh, let's take a look here. I have a lot of windows today. Um, so let's close this. Let's close that. Let's do that. I'm going to move this here. Let me just organize my windows. You guys know how I, how I am with these windows. Let's move that there. And then there's one more window down here. This is going to be one of my presentation windows. Let's go home here. Boom, boom. Okay, cool. So as you already know, we always start these streams off time stamping the day. People look back in history. They'll be able to say when this presentation happened. Um, 
or streamed, we can um, know what happened on that day. So we're going to take a look at the trending topics. Trending topics right now. Sean Payton uh, stepping away from the Saints. Distraction. Uh, something happened with the Bears. Distraction. Percy Jackson. Mm, Disney something or other. Distraction. Uh, Neil Young is mad at uh, Joe Rogan. He's grifting. Distraction. Uh, the Rock doing another movie. Distraction. Hall of Fame. Distraction. Yeah, EAY or whatever that is. Distraction. Pokemon. Distraction. Harden wants to leave Brooklyn allegedly. Distraction. Um, Wilbur Mora, a New York City police officer gravely wounded in a Harlem shooting that took his partner's life last week, has also died of his injuries. Damn, RIP. Um, some Vikings news. Distraction. Uh, something distraction Ramona. Um, some viewers are, are urging Bravo to take action against the Real Housewives of New York cast member Ramona Singer after the network said it would cease filming with the what is this offensive social media post? Oh, yeah, we went over that yesterday. She's like a, a white supremacist or something like that. A POC white supremacist? I have no idea. Something like that. Who cares? Distraction, Kansas City, distraction. Jim Banks uh, draws criticism for his recent tweet asking whether the public has ever seen another president attack or malign the free press in a uh, reference to President Joe Biden. Um, so let's talk about this really fast. Uh, I saw the clip of Joe Biden calling the press uh, a son of a bitch. And I frankly wasn't moved. I didn't care. I was like, OK, he called the press a son of a bitch. They are. Most of them are sons of bitches. Um and I just didn't understand why that was news yesterday. Now, I can understand why, because people are easily distracted and whatever. And, you know, the right wants to find, you know, anything wrong with Joe Biden. But I think there are more pressing issues with the Biden administration we could be discussing other than his um, hot mic comments. I know some people grifted off that topic yesterday. I, for one, did not. It just wasn't worth my time. I like to save my grift for more pressing issues, more important issues. I don't like to do the frivolous bottom feeder uh, topics. It's just kind of corny to me. Um, so yeah, people were critical of him and what he said. And I'm just like, who cares? Like, is this really a thing? Then they're pulling up old clips of Trump saying son of a bitch. And it's just like, so, like, how old are we? <laughs> Y'all never heard nobody curse before. Y'all never heard the term son of a bitch. Like, I don't know. Y'all just got to grow up, man. This is uh, really weird, you know, and I'm no fan of Biden, but um, if I'm going to be critical of Biden, there's a million things to be critical of. And his little off off the uh, record or, you know, hot mic comments just really aren't worth my time to really like sit here and dedicate a whole entire video to moving along. Hmm. Robert F. Kennedy apologized for referring to Anne Frank. For referring to Anne Frank at a rally put on by his anti anti jabby group. It's the second time since 2015 he has apologized for a Holocaust reference. You know, anytime you mention the Holocaust, you gotta apologize. You know, I probably have to apologize because I mentioned it. Um, uh, NFT artists. Well, speaking of NFT artists, um, I am now the owner of an NFT or. There's an NFT in my MetaMask wallet. You can find that right here. McNifty uh, NFTs. Shout out to McNifty NFTs, which reminds me. Um, you can't even see me. Hold on. All right. Whoops. Uh, let's go here. My bad. Okay. Now you can see me. Um, so, yeah, this is an NFT. <laughs> That I control. I am the controller of this NFT. This is number uh, 43. You can get those uh, now at OpenSea. I'll go ahead and show you right now. McNifty number 43. See Bernie Sanders. Um, Pocahontas. Biden in the background. Et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there's a whole bunch of them. Go participate. Get you one of these McNifty NFTs. Uh, moving along, back to the trending topics. Uh, Paris Hilton 
discussing NFTs. We just talked about NFTs and, um, Peter Dinklage has some thoughts about Disney's live action. Snow White. What is it? A black man playing Snow White now or something? Who knows what they're ready to do? Anyway, let's head to today's presentation. The crime of 1873. And um, there's a lot of information on the internet regarding this thing here. Um, Kamar Daniels, donations, donations, donations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> chat is, is uh, pontificating on the topics here today. What up, chat? <laughs> um, oh, so I'm not going to use Amadeus anymore because I'm getting hit with copyright claims. So I can't do the music anymore. So, oh, well, it's all good. I'll find a way around it. We'll get some music on here that's not on the Internet. Legalities. Don't you hate lawyers? Sorry, I'm eating right now, but this is my first meal of the day. I have to eat. I've been starving. It's 3 p.m. I haven't eaten all day. I've been running on PR fumes. Um, yesterday, I got a total of four hours sleep. And I kind of caught up on sleep today. I don't think I woke up till like 11 a.m. I was watching the Tata Steel Chess Tournament. Magnus Carlsen won today. Fabi, Fabi won. Fabian Carano. Congrats to all the winners. So let's get into the presentation. So, in the Patriot Report, I'm masking a conspiracy of money war available now. <clears throat> On Amazon and my website, hotepsjesus.com. We're going to be talking about this chapter, the crime of 1873. I'm going to read some excerpts here from this. First of all, I just want to give props to everybody watching this. You could be anywhere consuming any type of content, but you've chosen to ingratiate yourself in learning more about your country learning more about money learning more about history and this is the stuff that's going to make you high IQ and this is going to give you an edge over your competition it's going to make you smarter than your friends so let's get into it <clears throat> it says here crime of 1873 john r elsom and the lightning over the treasury building if you watched the last presentation you know i referenced that document as well it makes a claim that the international banksters wanted to debase or demonetize silver in the United States and so <clears throat> they lobbied to have the coinage act of 1873 passed this is what he claims he said but after careful research I said it seems that this move had already been put into play with the coinage act of 1853 so let's go there Mm, I actually did not plan to pull this up, <clears throat> but I'm going to pull it up now because, hey, you know, um, I can do that. Looks like I already have some highlights here, so we'll pull this up on your screen in just a moment. <clears throat> it says, Coinage Act of 1853 it was a piece of legislation passed by the United States Congress which lowered the silver content of the silver half dime dime quarter dollar and half dollar and authorized a three dollar gold piece although intending to stabilize the country's silver shortage it in effect pushed the united states closer to abandoning abandoning bimetallism entirely and adopting the gold standard it says here small uh, silver denominations in the united states were disappearing as the bullion value of silver far exceeded the face value of U.S. silver coinage. In response, Congress debated a bill which would overvalue most forms of silver coinage and authorize the U.S. Mint to purchase bullion for the new coins. The legislation lowered the silver content 
of most silver coins by 7% and was signed into law on February 21st, 1853. So the Coinage Act of 1873, people would purport to be the first crime or the crime. But as I've shown you here, uh, silver had previously been debased. <sighs> now we have to go into so the conspiracy he lays out has to do with the fact the United States had an abundant supply of silver while English while England, I'm sorry. Wait, what are you seeing on your screen right now? Hold on a second. Let me just make sure you're saying the right thing. Cool. All right. Uh, actually, let's go here. Cool. Shout out to let's go dot finance. Um, so evidence of this silver shortage in England can be found <clears throat> in the passing of the Great Coinage Act of 1816. I'm sorry. Wait, uh, the conspiracy has laid out has to do with the fact the United States had an abundant supply of silver while England was suffering from a shortage. This moves like a global. Cons this move looks like a global conspiracy to create a balance of power. Um, so you saw here in 1853, Congress purported that there was uh, a shortage in silver, and now, only 20 years later, there seems to be overabundance of silver in the country. Um, and because they have to again debase and outlaw silver to a certain extent it seems that congress has no idea what they're doing from a monetary standard and we're going to go into um that later um with some uh information from congressional record um so let's go to it says evidence of this silver shortage in england can be found in the passing of the great coinage act of 1816. so let's go to the great coinage act of 1816 put that on your screen in just a moment So here we have the Great Coinage of 1816 was an attempt by the government of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland to restabilize its currency. The pound sterling after the economic difficulties brought by the French Revolutionary Wars and the Napoleonic Wars. Now, if anybody knows anything about my book, um, The Patriot Report, Unmasking Conspiracy of Money and War, you do know that money is often tied to war. And as you can see here, um, economic difficulties it says right here on your favorite entrusted website wikipedia <laughs> the economic difficulties brought by the french revolutionary wars and the napoleonic wars again when you see um, economic strife often war is right behind it <clears throat> debt is created shout out to kamar daniels for donating he's paid his tuition up today appreciate you Shout out to people who cash at me. I appreciate you. Um, cash app, dollar sign, Hotep Jesus. Let's continue. So, I want to go back to what you saw on your screen previously. Some work by Murray Rothbard here. And this is from his work, uh, Murray Rothbard, A History of Money and Banking in the United States. And I have several quotes from that book here. Um, I did read that book in its entirety. Uh, and uh, I suggest you do the same. That's Murray Rothbard, A History of Money and Banking in the United States. And that was um, necessary reading for me in order to write this book and um, do it with accuracy. Um, shout out to Mises Caucus as well for providing me with that book and making that thing available. Uh, I believe it's MisesInstitute.org or something like that. Anyway, and uh, Mises, cut me a check, man. Make, make, uh, make me a, a, an endorser. Sponsor me. Somebody make that happen. Um, anyway, after 1810, only silver coin. This is a quote from Murray Rothbard. He says, after 1810, only silver coin, largely overvalued Spanish-American fractional silver coin circulated in the United States. He continues, he says the Spanish dollar from the 16th and from the 16th to the 19th century was relatively the most stable and least debased coin in the Western world. He continues, he says from 1810 until 1834, only silver coin, domestic and foreign, circulated in the United States. Last statement here 
uh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, last statement is as far as just some regular information goes before we get into the conspiracy. He says the U.S. fixed mint ratio greatly undervalued gold and overvalued silver. As a result, gold flowed out of the country and silver flowed in so that after 1810, only silver coin, largely overvalued Spanish American fractional silver coin circulated in the United States. Okay. So. Gold was undervalued, so people got rid of it. And silver was overvalued, so people hoarded it. Um, one thing I should probably put a, a, on your desk right now uh, before we continue. Um, and this is um, a phenomenon that I, I would um, relate to uh, Bitcoin with, and it's called uh, Gresham's Law. And I'm going to show you that right here. And it says right here, Gresham's law, observation of economics that bad money drives out good. More exactly, if coins containing metal of a different value have the same value as legal tender, the coins composed of the cheaper metal will be used for payment, while those made of expensive metal will be hoarded or exported and thus tend to disappear from circulation. So when we talk about Bitcoin, Bitcoin has uh, a higher value than the U.S. dollar, because right now I think there are what's the. Uh, it's thirty six thousand. Uh, uh, thirty six thousand dollars to one Bitcoin. OK. Um, and so when you think about Bitcoin, uh, I need you to think about Gresham's law. Um, do big do people usually want to spend their Bitcoin? The answer is no. They usually want to hoard it. They usually want to save it. And that is due to Gresham's law because bad money drives out good. So basically the bad money, a.k.a. the U.S. dollar is driving Bitcoin out of the market and people are tending to hoard it. OK, and that's why you don't see it in circulation as much. So sometimes people ask me, say, hey, Bitcoin is Bitcoin a currency. I'm like, technically, it's a currency and technically it's not because it's not circulating. Um, a current needs to be moving. Right. So there's not much circulation of Bitcoin, uh, certainly uh, not as much as the United States dollar is being circulated. And we're going to go into United States dollar a little bit later. Um, so again, here it says the cheaper metal will be used for payment while those made of expensive metal will be hoarded. So people will use the dollar for payment. That's why when Bitcoin people ask me, they say, hey, will people still be using the dollar? I say, yeah, absolutely, because, you know, you'll want to give that stuff up. Like, here, take these dollars. I don't want these dollars, but this expensive digital gold, I want to hoard that. I want to keep that because that is value. This is why it's very important for you guys to take my class and to take these classes uh, so you can understand um, these uh, monetary phenomenon. OK, let's uh, go back to the presentation. And then we're going to get into the conspiracy uh, portion of this thing. So in my book, I said, as far as there being a conspiracy, Rothbard also corroborates this claim. What did Rothbard say? Rothbard said the calculated and covert drive by the Wall Street banks led by the Morgans and Rockefellers for cartelization of the entire banking industry with themselves and their political allies at the helm. This is what Murray Rothbard said. This is not Hotep Jesus. OK, this is not. Uh, some rag website, the St. Alex Jones. OK. This is Murray Rothbard. Eminent uh, scholar. Hold on, I'm retweeting people who shared the stream today. Shout out to Kamar, Gav, Gavin Neese. Thank you. Uh, who's this? Hotep Architect. Thank you for sharing today's presentation. 
Guy Wilson Mendez. Thank you. You guys are gems. <clears throat> Let's get back to it. He continues and Murray Rothbard continues and he says, <clears throat> the demonetization of silver was a crime in the sense that it was done shiftly, deceptively by men who knew that they wanted to demonetize silver. And this is going to get very, very convoluted in a moment. I'm going to need you guys to stay with me. We're going to pull up a couple of sources, real live sources. We're going to dive into some conspiracies, some conspiracies that have been allegedly debunked. Um, so this is going to get could get confusing, but I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, so. I'll skip that paragraph because you guys can get the book. Patriot Report, Unmasking Conspiracy, Money and War, available on Amazon and my website, hotepjesus.com or briansharp.co, and dive right into this next thing. Let's go to the bribe conspiracy. You'll see this on your screen in just a moment. So, the conspiracy theory says that the Bank of England representative Ernest Said or Syed came to the U.S. in 1872 and bribed congressmen with the sum of what is estimated to be five hundred thousand dollars worth of gold to secure the passage of the coinage act. OK, uh, the source of this conspiracy theory comes from Senator Daniel of Virginia in a Senate speech on May 22nd, 1890, where he quoted the Bankers magazine, August 1873. And he says in 1872, silver being demonetized in Germany and England and Holland, a capital of uh, 500,000 in today's uh, gold was raised or 100,000, 100,000 pound was raised. And Ernest Said was sent to this country with this fund as an agent for foreign bondholders to the same uh, to the effect of the same object. OK. Now, I say right here in my book, I say this claim I can neither confirm nor deny. However, there is absolute proof that say did influence the passage of this act. Um, or at least he had some say so. OK, let's take a look. Um, let's bring this back on your screen. And let's go to our trusted source. Wikipedia. <laughs> and let's go to what they say about Ernest Said. So it says here, Ernest Said, a German born. Hold on. Can you see that? OK. Ernest Said, a German born British author, banker and economist, particularly known for his expertise in coinage and foreign exchange and for his advocacy of bimetallism. OK, so let's go down here. And. um Actually, we're not ready for that yet. Let's first. Well, here are no, actually, no, we're good. We can stay right here and then we'll bounce back and forth. So it says here the crime of 1876 was a hoax. It says in 1873, a story started circulating that Ernest Said, a London banker, had bribed Congress to pass the Coinage Act 1873, which discontinued the minting of silver dollars. For example, here's how the Ohio Democrat explained the situation to its rival newspaper, the Canton Repository. I'm not going to read that part. Um, so this is Congress finally investigated. For, so it says here, Congress finally investigated the story in 1893, 20 years after the alleged crime. And it turned out there was never any such story in Bankers Magazine and that the excerpt from the Congressional Globe, the predecessor to the Congressional Record, had been altered. Hooper did not say that Sade was now here and he did not call him a bullinist. The original read. So this is uh, Bankers Magazine. Um, and it, it has the uh, congressional record right here. Um, but it doesn't exactly link to the correct right here. It says number five, the citation number five, you go to number five, us house rep, da, 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 but it doesn't link to banker magazine. So I can, like I said in my book, I can neither confirm nor deny that what Senator Daniel of Virginia said was quoted in Banker Magazine of 1873. Somebody needs to get a copy of that. I tried and failed. Um, 
but apparently um, Wikipedia is saying it does not exist. Um, so, you know, maybe it's somewhere and whatever. So let's just continue. Let's go back to um, the slide. And it's going to, this is going to get really interesting. So it says here, William Darrer, Pig Iron Kelly, uh, placed Congressman Samuel Hooper of Massachusetts as director of the bill in April 1872. To find a proof that Congressman Hooper was influenced by Sade, we have to look no further than the words of Hooper himself. If we refer to the Congressional Globe, House Representatives, 42nd Congress, second session, pages 2000. 304 and 2305 his own words read of Said. it says here mr Said of london a distinguished writer who has given attention to the subject of mints and coinage after examining the first draft of the bill furnished many valuable suggestions which have been incorporated in this bill so uh yes in fact we have tied mr Said to influencing this bill um so uh, we actually have to pull that up because I don't want to mislead anyone. So we're going to go right to that page and show you where it says that in the congressional record. They have a copy of the letter here in the congressional record. I took the time to find it. And you'll see it in just a second. It's going to be at the top of this page here. <clears throat> As we wait for it to load. Chat, everything good? Uh, yeah, no, no background music. Oh, you guys can't see. Hold on, my bad. Um, okay, here we go. Now you guys can see. Um, wait. Where is it? Uh, hold on. Um, uh, did I pass it? Oh, wait, no, I'm on the wrong source. My bad. Here it is. I'm sorry. I'm on the wrong. I'm on a, I'm on a whole different source. Um, I think no. What's going on? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me. Uh, where are we? Bear with me for a moment. I just have way too many tabs open. So we're talking about the letter published right here. Let's pull that up. Should be on page 132, I believe. Um, yes, this is the letter here. Okay, you see here it says La Princess Street Bank. This is in London, February 17th, 1872. Remember that, February 17th, 1872, because it wasn't, the coinage act wasn't fully passed until, I believe it was May 1872. So this is definitely him. Um, sliding in uh, prior to and um, let me just uh, do a search here I think that's probably the easiest thing for me to do instead of trying to use my eyes um, Oh, yeah, that's right. This was a long letter. It's at the end of the letter. Now I remember. OK, hold on. We have to go to the end of the letter. And I believe it was a pretty long letter. Yeah, it was on like page 140 something. I remember now. Here it is right here. 
Let me see right here. It says Ernest Sade. Um, wait, I think it's one page back. Hmm. I think it's very important to show you this. Uh, just so you know, I'm not copy and pasting and putting stuff uh, on your desk that does not actually exist. This one is this page, it's not this page. Hmm. Oh wait, I'm sorry. I'm I'm looking at Oh wait, we're oh I'm looking for something we haven't gotten to yet. That's why I'm not finding it. Um this is uh I'm I'm ahead of myself. I'm ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Hold on. So all right, let, since we're here, let me show you this then. Um I was I was jumping to something else, I believe. What's on your screen? Here it goes right here. So the letter, right? You see it right here. Um, and let me just pull this back up so we have it in both places. So it says here, the letter to Syed was found and published. And um, we're going to show you a part in here uh, from the actual letter. And we're going to read that right here. And it says, Hold on. I'm going to put it on your screen two ways. I want you to see it both ways. So you're going to see it here. Right here. I'm skipping around. I'm sorry, but it's all good. Right here. Letter from Say to Hooper. It's because Wikipedia showed you this. So we'll just hop right to this. It says right here. Letter from Say to Hooper. And I just want to show you that is in fact true that this letter did occur or did happen. Um, and it says right here, I am myself, as you will perceive from our writings and others with me in favor of the full and complete adoption of the double valuation, giving full legal tender to coins as low as even one fourth dollar in value. Believing that this is the only true system upon which a future universal system of coinage can be based. So universal system, I brought in a question because it means, you know, I'm, I'm questioning, is this include London and in, in, in the rest of the world or universal as in just the United States? Anyway, it says, nevertheless, recognizing the difficulty of carrying this point at present and in order to enable you to uphold the essential features of the gold valuation, I limit my recommendations to the issue of this single full value dollar piece under the proposed restrictions to tender value to 50 to 100 dollars. So he's basically giving um, suggestions on the denominations and he's saying 50 to 150 or 100 dollars is uh, is a good denomination. Uh, partly for enabling you without drawback or inconvenience, whatever, to widen or close the valuation question at any time. And partly in order to relieve you of the unsuitable obligations of the mint to redeem a surplus of either token silver or the token copper coinage. See, basically what they're saying is, you know, if somebody wanted to take their paper money and they had, um, you know, wanted to redeem it in silver coinage, they would need at least 50 to a hundred dollars, which is a substantial amount of money in those days to redeem that silver, uh, from the treasury. If you were to say, Hey, we have, you know, smaller denominations, then more of your silver can be taken from the treasury. Um, what do you see on your screen right now? Oh, my bad. You didn't even see it. My bad. It's right here. I'll show it to you right here. I'll highlight it just so you know. I ain't playing no funny games. 
this paragraph right here. Ah, come on. This paragraph right here is what I just read to you. This is in the congressional record. Actually, I'm sorry. It's in the congressional record, but they quote the history of the coinage act by United States Congress house. So technically, I guess it is congressional record. Okay. So you got that. I just like to be thorough and make sure you guys have um, everything you need to be equipped. And there's no, um, uh, Unc said you griff blocking HJ. Huh? I ain't griff blocking. Tune in, drop out. $50. Thank you. Whoa. Heavy tuition payment there. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. He said any medium exchange functions at the unit of measure for the socioeconomic force. Let me think about that for a second. Any medium of exchange functions as a unit of measure. Hmm. I don't know about that. Financial institutions attempt to control and regulate the source of this power. Markets represent the socioeconomic circuitry that power flows through. I do agree with that. I do agree with that. That does make sense. All right, let's go back to um, the book. So, um, hold on. Cool. So it says here. Um, as far as him being bribed, I can't prove that. I can't deny it either, but I can't prove that Ernest said, and Ernest said is very interesting. He has some interesting words and we're going to dive into that shortly. Um, so we talked about, uh, Samuel Hooper and the congressional record and the letter to him. Um, so I, I concluded, I said, whether or not there was conspiracy or not, I'll leave that up to you to decide. But there is clear evidence that a U.S. congressman was influenced by a foreign representee when drafting this coinage act. But there's more evidence to feed the conspiracy, the Lukenbach affidavit. So now let's go to the Lukenbach affidavit and let's pull this up. So right here, Wikipedia says by 1890, the alleged plot had been termed the crime of 1873. In 1892, the case was bolstered by was coast was bolstered when Frederick A. Luckenbach gave an affidavit that <clears throat> when Luckenbach had dined with Sade in 1874, Sade had told him just that story. At the same time, Luckenbach was selling mining equipment to silver miners in Colorado. The president of the state silver league persuaded him to give the affidavit about what Syed allegedly told him. So they're basically saying is Luckenbach was motivated to say something bad about Sade, you know, in regards to uh, debasing uh, and outlawing silver coinage. It says here, Congress finally investigated the story in 73, 20 years after the alleged crime. Oh, OK. So we, we went over that. Right. So let's go into the Lukenbach affidavit. Let's let's see what this thing says here. Um, and it says. Uh, let me see the source that they have. OK. Just want to check the source they had uh, to make sure I'm not missing anything. So, um, Frederick A. Luckenbach, Philadelphia inventor and businessman, appeared before the clerk of the Supreme Court at Denver, Colorado, James A. Miller, on May 6, 1892, and gave the following affidavit in regard to a conversation he had with Sade in London. He claims that Ernest Sade made the following statement in regard to the alleged bribe. This is allegedly is what Ernest said, said, Sade said. He said, I went to America in the winter of 1872-73, authorized to secure, if I could, a bill demonetizing silver. It was to the interest of those I represented, the governors of the Bank of England, to have it done. I took with me 100,000 sterling. 100,000 pounds of sterling uh, with instructions that if it was not sufficient to accomplish the object to draw another 100,000 pounds or as much as necessary continues and says, I saw the committee of the House and Senate paid the money and stayed in America until I knew the measure was safe. All right. <clears throat> 
so. Here's where um, here's where things get really interesting and convoluted. As I said before, things will get convoluted, and I think it's it's deceptive. It could be. Well, let me not say that. I'll let you draw your own conclusions. I prefer you draw your own conclusions as I dive into this thing here. So let's go back to what Wikipedia says. So here, although Sade and Hooper were long since dead, the letter that Sade had written to Hooper was found and published. Now we're going to go in and we're going to actually look at um, this letter and in fine detail and see what it says. It says the letter contained page after page of technical rep- uh, recommendations, followed by an impassioned plea for keeping the silver dollar, exactly the opposite of what had been insulated, ins- insinuated. Said, as it turned out, had been one of the foremost advocates of silver in England and an expert on bimetallism. Said advocated for silver in all his works and had been consulted on the coinage bill because he had written a 250 page book. Suggestions in reference to the metallic currency in the United States. Congressmen distanced themselves from the story and even issued formal apologies for the allegations. So again, I can neither confirm nor deny that Sade was an agent of the uh, London bankers with ne- nefarious aims or a nefarious agenda. But I think that sidesteps what's really happening here, right? Because it says right here, the crime of 1873 hoax, right? And then they, and then they continue here. And then Wikipedia says, um, in 1870, for example, here's how to, um, so it says here, but an alleged plot had been termed the crime of 1873. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if. This is where Wikipedia gets funny, right? Because it says by 1890, the alleged plot had been turned to crime of 1873. The plot that they purport is not the plot of crime. It's not the same plot, right? So there's two plots. There's one here that can uh, potentially be debunked. And that's that Ernest Sade was the London um, agent, agent for the London bankers with nefarious aims, right? That's not the crime we're talking about. The crime is the actual bill itself. And we're going to dive into Sade's work and exactly what Sade said to show you how this is a crime. And real fast, just to reiterate, don't forget what Rothbard said. Rothbard ain't talking about Sade and a letter and London and and, and, um, and bribes. He's not talking about that. He says right here, the demonetate deep. Demonetization of silver was a crime. This is what Rothbard literally says. He says the demonetization of silver was a crime in the sense that it was done shiftly, deceptively by men who knew that they wanted to demonetize silver. And he says the calculated and covert drive by Wall Street bankers led by the Morgans and Rothschilds for the car- for a cartelization of the entire banking industry with themselves and their political allies at the helm. And, and Mr. Said in his letter does refer to um, a future of universal system of coinage, right? So Wikipedia here saying that this plot was termed 1873 is actually misleading. This is misleading. I'm going to highlight that in red. It's misleading. That's not the crime, Wikipedia. And this is how they, they fool and deceive people because they talk about this plot and the London bankers and this, that and the third. And it's just like, nah, like forget them letters. Uh, we'll not forget the letters because we're going to dive into the letter. The letter is very important. And, it, and, 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 and Wikipedia is right. Said was an advocate of silver. He was an advocate of silver. And we're going to go to that letter right now. I think it's important. Let's just go there right now. Let's not waste any more time. I'm going to pull up. um, So let's go here. Um, 
I want to go to the beginning of the letter. I think the first few pages of the letter, he talks about gold. Uh, gold being the standard, right? So you're going to see here. See here, he starts off and he starts talking about gold and, you know, how gold is, uh, uh, as, the, as gold being the standard and whatever, whatever, right? So let's, let's go to when he starts talking about silver. Um, let's zoom in a little bit so you guys can see this better. <clears throat> nope. Let's see. It's on this page. Okay, cool. So here, uh, I'm not going to bore you with this part, but this is section 46 of the bill. And he's talking about like, which I found to be interesting. So actually, let's just dive into this real fast. He said, Section 46 allows the melter and refiner one thousandth part of weight for gold and one and one half thousand for silver waste and to the coiner one half thousand for gold and one thousandth for silver waste. These are enormous allowances, which, in my opinion, are tantamount to only to legalizing pilfering to that extent. So I, I think I can compare this to, um, let me highlight this so you can see where we're at right here. So shout out to Ernest Said. He's like dropping gems throughout this entire letter to Mr. Hooper. Um, hold on a second. So when I mentioned about the FDA, it's like the FDA even says, hey, you know, a certain amount of dog shit or whatever is allowed in your food. Right. I don't know the exact verbiage. Right. But a certain amount of feces and insects are allowed in our food supply and that can be considered legal. Right. So here what they're basically saying is the melter and refiner of the coinage is allowed some measure of waste. Right. Right. So, you know, in the process of this guy, you know, melting down bullion and coining things, you know, there's some waste. Right. And he's saying, no, there shouldn't be any waste. <laughs> and that's what this section talks about. Like here, he says the evaporation of pure gold and silver only takes place when the metal, metal is much overheated. And particles of it by stirring go up the flue where they can be found. This subject has been well tested here and elsewhere and evaporation has been found uh, so infinitesimal that one one hundredth uh, thousand part will cover it over and over again, notwithstanding all the assertions and statistics of other mint officers. And then he goes on and he talks about that. So I'm not going to get into that anymore, but it just goes to show you like this, this, um, this bill he, he highlights in section 40 had legalized pilfering. That's what he calls it, right? Wikipedia don't mention none of this. Wikipedia don't mention none of this. So let's go to the next page and we'll show you how um, American citizens were robbed. Um, so here again, Mr. Said warns, he says, I now come to the most important part of the bill that of the valuation which according to section 15 omits the coinage silver dollar and confirms the debased silver coinage of half dollars and below the tender a limit of five dollars i am aware of course that through the amendment of 1853 the same debased coinage remember we talked about that right coinage act of 1853 uh he said i am aware of course that through the amendment of 1853 the same debased coinage was already established but although the actual coinage of the silver dollar had um practically ceased still that piece was not abolished by law as this new uh bill presumably repeals all previous enactments i suppose that the total uh, 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 uh abolition of silver is contemplated so then he goes on and um he uses this word um Injudicious. Injudicious. 
And I want to find that because that's an important statement. And uh, I forget where he used it, but we'll find it. Don't worry. And I would have had highlights on this, but the way this document is, it, it, it won't allow me. So here, let's read this. He said it can it, it cannot be asserted, for instance, that gold pieces of one half or one quarter dollar can be used. Hence, the idea of a limit in size must be maintained and there can only be one true limit, so to speak. This true limit excludes the one dollar piece at at once. Indeed, the two and a half pieces somewhat below it, and all European mint masters agree with me that gold pieces of about three and three quarter dollars should be the smallest. Unfortunately, almost all the monetary systems are committed to smaller pieces. Bearing in mind, however, that the one dollar piece is absolutely away from this limit, it would seem injudicious to select it as a unit of value. It would be like starting with an imperfect thing. And this is talking about um, using gold as the unit of value, right? Because that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to make gold the standard. And he says it's injudicious to select it as a unit of value. This, at least this, uh, this uh, unit, this uh, unit of measure, right? Which uh, I think he says one dollar piece. So that'd be ridiculous. OK, he calls it injudicious. Anyway, let's continue. I'm just want to point out how Congress just doesn't know what they're doing and he's just tearing their bill apart. Um, and then we're going to go to the part where he robs, talks about the robbery. So here it says, apart from the theory, why should America have given up her silver dollar? The cause of its disappearance from circulation is due to the error of there being too much silver in the piece right that could have that cause would have been removed if the dollar weighed 100 grains that being the true portion of da 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 so again um people in treasury um uh proving that they are not equipped with um coining money properly um Then he talks about this, the supply. So here he makes a claim or he quotes this claim. Hold on, let me find a part. So right here, it says against this danger of too much silver in America. Remember, we're talking about that's why they wanted to debase it. Right. So he says against this danger of too much silver, American guard itself without the total total abolition of the full valued silver dollar. It is but necessary. So to modify the severity of the gold, uh, to modify the severity of the gold evaluation as to admit of a reasonable use of silver dollars. So he's basically making a case and saying, yo, y'all don't got to get rid of silver. It's totally fine. Um, let's go to the next page and this is where you're going to find the damning information um, here he talks about um, um, I think this is an important part to read I wasn't going to read this but uh, now that I remember maybe I should it says I may now mention that um, Mr. William Newmark uh, who as president of the economical branch of the social sciences Congress lately delivered uh, a speech basically on the advantage which he supposed England had derived from the gold valuation nevertheless agrees with me that we in England might with advantage issue a full valued four shilling piece without disturbing the gold valuation and that we might thereby mitigate against the evil of a constant and periodical scarcity of silver coin in the hands of lower classes and correspondingly constant or periodical soul sur surplus in the hands of bankers. So he's talking about like this imbalance, right? Like the way that they're managing their monetary system, basically uh, the good money is going up to the top and then there's a scarcity at the bottom amongst the lower classes. Let me see if there's any more in here I wanted to show you. Inside the number no portions, da da da. And on the hand, say the decision to be governed. 
Those are the one complaining is too heavy in the pocket. Has an idea and a validity, so it doesn't have to be suppressed. It might find a man and gold enough in the world to furnish a means. Exchange. Right. Required for money. Um, I, I definitely suggest you read this letter. You could learn a lot. Um, is that, is that it? Uh, okay. I think this is it here. Right. Here it goes. All right. Here's the part I wanted you to, uh, to see. It says more than three fourths of the inhabitants of this country. And this is why this letter is so important. Just this paragraph right here, this, this sentence, I, I read all this just for this sentence right here. More than three fourths, 75% of the country for their daily or weekly transactions use silver coin, must use silver coin because the amounts involved cannot be paid in gold, all right? So gold is certain denomination and silver is the smaller denomination. So if you want a piece of candy, you can't pay for it in gold because there's no gold in that denomination. He said, true, if an individual in that class receives a sovereign, he can get it changed, though not without trouble. And even at times with the tax of the glass of beer as an excuse. But that is not the point for this question of the change. One is uh, of one or more sovereign stands apart from the great question of the universal supply of these less valuable mediums in exchange for the purpose of encouraging and developing consumption production between the three fourths of the nation themselves. So let me ask you this question. If 75% of the inhabitants of a country are using silver and you, you basically outlaw silver, you debase silver, what do you think is going to happen to 75% of the nation? Well, as I showed you before, following this act, what came? Um, hold on, I'm gonna find it. There were several panics. Um, and I wanna make sure I get this to you. Here we go. So, um, you have the panics of 1873, 1893, and 1907 that come after the Coinage Act of 1873. So, 1873, they have a Coinage Act, and in that very same year, there's an economic panic. <laughs> right? So let's go back to Wikipedia because this is where Wikipedia is misleading. Wikipedia said, let me check on the chat. Everybody good? Everybody good? Uh, no music. I got hit with a copyright, so no music. Um, it says right here, by 1890, the alleged plot had been termed the crime of 1873. But as I told you, Murray Rothbard was not referring to any bribery. And I'll repeat that one more time what he said. He said the demonetization of silver was a crime. Quote unquote is what Murray Rothbard says. The demonetate demonetization of silver was a crime. But Wikipedia would had you would have you believe that some bribery is reason why people call the crime of 1873 a crime. No, it has to do with the demonetization of silver. And then they hear. They, they literally make a case for Sade. They said Sade couldn't have been an agent because he made an impassioned plea for keeping the silver dollar. Exactly the opposite of what have been ins insinuated. And it turned out he was one of the foremost advocates of silver in England. This is what Wikipedia says. So they're like, they double speaking right here. He's an advocate and he was, he in fact was. All throughout this letter, he's he's saying like, yo, you, you know, here, if you want to mess with silver, here's how I would do it. Right. But it says right here, more than three fourths of the country was using silver coin and must use silver coin because the amounts involved cannot be paid in gold. Wait, I'm sorry. 
But again, what they would have you to believe. So, so here's my question. Here's my question. If Sade was warning the United States Congress, this Mr. Hooper individual, and saying like, yo, don't debase silver. If you're going to do anything, here's how you do it. Why was the coinage act still passed? And he literally laid out, he literally laid out every single provision. Like I didn't read the whole letter because I just don't want to bore you to death. But it's this pages here of him telling them how to manipulate the currency. Right? In a good way. And he's saying, don't get rid of silver. So right here he says. A curious feature in connection. Oh, shit. Where'd that go? A curious feature right here at the bottom. In connection with this matter is off repeated saying there is no demand for silver uh, for silver. Blowing, blowing hot and blowing cold. Right. So this 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 is just talk. He say I, I he. He, he here, here he says, I say the demand for silver has been destroyed. The strength to use it is gone. Pauperism is too great to make a demand such as would satisfy the authorities. Right. So say say it looks like he's on the side of the United States people, if you ask me. But what happened? What happened? Why did the act still get passed? Well, I have another piece of literature I'm going to put across your desk right now. Can you see that? Let me see. Okay, wonderful. And this is um, news.uga.edu, um, basically University of Georgia. And it says here, uh, September 7th, 2021, by Leigh Beesom, says eliminating cash could benefit average U.S. families. <laughs> 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 um so this is this is where alex jones is correct where he says they're going to get rid of the dollar move into a world world digital currency so here they say new study shows tax cuts could offset giving up physical currency so this is again um double speak you know so he says here soon 50 and 100 dollars bills may be a thing of the past that's the future uh, some economists are predicting and what? Why? Because they want people transacting um, in, in large amounts with cash. And he's going to tell you why right here. He said, but will people be better off without paper money? New, new research from the University of Georgia suggests they could be as long as certain taxes are lowered, too. So that's what they're trying to say. They're trying to offset this argument by saying, hey, we'll get rid of cash, but we'll lower your taxes. But you'll see in a second why that makes little sense. It says our analysis of the costs and benefits of proposals to eliminate currency implies that doing away with big bills in the 50s, uh, do away with big bills like 50s and hundreds could benefit the average person, even though they like using cash. Yes, yes, yes. I love cash. I love cash. I do keep cash around. I keep cash around because I like cash. I like doing transactions in cash. I don't need the government in my business when I'm transacting with people. Just don't. Um, so I keep cash. I even have cash in my pocket. I got I get cash on my desk. I got cash in my pocket. And, and you should too. You should always have cash in your pocket because you never know when you're going to be somewhere stranded and you just need some cash, right? Um, and and it, it's very important to have cash because you just never know, right? Um, case of emergency, something's got to happen. Da 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 da. So, uh, my dad told me that he said, in case of emergency, always keep cash around. Um, so he says, less cash means less tax evasion, so the government can reduce other taxes. <laughs> so this is what this is about. This is exactly what this is about. Here's the motive: less cash means less tax evasion. So they don't want you using cash because, and we're going to go in here, it says physical currency has an uh, anonymity, has anonymity to it. Some words I can't look at when I say them because I'll mispronounce them. The government doesn't know you have it. And if you don't report it, wait, let me read that again. The government doesn't know you have it if you don't report it. 
and loses out on tax revenue from those hidden dollars. This is their issue. The government doesn't know you have it. You damn skippy, bro. I don't need them to know. I don't need them to know. Let's continue. Cash transactions are also largely untraceable. Good. You know the difference between um, cash and cryptocurrency? Except for things like Monero. Monero has a privacy blockchain, which I like. Shout out to the dude who brought them up. But cryptocurrency is uh, attached to uh, a public ledger, which means the government can see everything you're doing and where all your money is going at all times while you're transacting. And this is, this is exactly why they're going to move to the Fed coin, a cryptocurrency, because everything is going to be tracked and everything will be watched and everybody will be able to see it and they'll be able to watch everywhere your money goes. It says because of that, people paying for illegal goods or services. They should also put legal goods, but they don't. They put illegal goods because they want to demonize cash and get rid of it. But people pay, I'll put it in there. I'll say people paying for illegal or legal goods or services and those who are simply trying to avoid paying taxes. As if we shouldn't are more likely to do so in cash and often in 50 and 100 dollar bills published in the European Economic Review. The system uses macroeconomic uh, modeling to predict how eliminating physical cash would affect individuals overall well-being from producing and consuming goods and services. The model builds in subtle trade-offs that the economy faces when cash is used for transactions. When people use cash to hide their income from the IRS and reduce their taxes, for example. <laughs> Do you see what they just said? <laughs> when the people use cash to hide their income from the IRS and reduce their taxes. So the government is saying, don't you reduce your taxes. We'll do it for you. <laughs> and that's what this comes down to. Um, but at the same time, tax avoidance, in effect, lowers tax rates. That, uh, but in effect, at the same time, tax avoidance, in effect, lowers tax rates that consumers and businesses face, increasing productivity of uh, labor and capital. That boosts the, nationals, the nation's GDP and is good for the economy. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump down. So it says right here, the model focused on the average American household. A more general version of the model shows that lower income households who are more likely to use cash for day to day transactions will likely be more negatively affected by eliminating cash. <laughs> And then you get the butt. They always gonna throw that butt in there. But there are ways for the government to compensate for that. But so let's look at this. This is again, history repeats itself. You are doomed to repeat it if you don't study it. it says right here, a more general version of the model shows that lower income households who are more likely to use cash for day to day transactions will be more, will be likely more negatively affected by eliminating cash. And what did Sage say? Sage said right here. More than three fourths of inhabitants of the country for their daily and weekly transactions use silver coinage, must use silver coinage because the amounts involved cannot be paid in gold. History is literally repeating itself right in front of our face. And these people are just talking about, but, but, all right, but there are ways to government, but there are ways for the government to compensate for that. He quotes right here. He says, you're going to have to provide them with some offset. Listrape said, what we're suggesting is to take cash away, but reduce taxes. It turns out this more than just compensates for not having cash, but it can actually make people better off. I doubt that. I doubt that. Right here, he says, my co-authors and I uh, will be the first to admit that our paper uh, does not provide the final word on cash suppression policies. And that more research is needed to be confident in what should be done. But our view is that models like ours that the account uh, that account for many of the unintended consequences of such policies and that carefully measure overall costs and benefits are essential for determining the right path. So, um, you know, so that had me thinking about um, when they put um, Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill. And I'm like, hmm, maybe people will hold on to that. 
So that's kind of like taking a 20 out of circulation because people are like, oh, this is pretty cool. Um, so I'll keep this as uh, a keepsake. Um, so yeah, that concludes today's presentation. Um, Toulon didn't read version on uh, the crime of 1873 uh, caused a, caused a panic of 1873 due to the demonetization of silver, uh, basically debasing silver and outlawing silver. Uh, Wikipedia, what have you believe this is about bribes. Uh, but Ernest Said has shown that you didn't have to do that. And they chose to do it anyway. Um, and uh, the American people suffered. Um, Murray Rothbard actually called it a crime. People have been working all their life with silver. And then one day you just up and say, hey, silver's no good. And we're going to debase it and destroy its value. You're basically stealing people's labor. That's what you're doing. And that's what inflation does, too. When they print more dollars, they're basically stealing your labor. Um, when I come back. Um, for the next presentation, we are going to discuss the Federal Reserve. It's going to be right here in the same playlist, the Patriot Report playlist. So uh, look out for that. That is going to be a long presentation because of this Federal Reserve. We're not going to discuss the um, existing Federal Reserve. This is a history um, document. We are actually going to uh, discuss how the Federal Reserve was created because some people like to say this is conspiracy theory, um, but it's conspiracy fact. I'll hang around for five minutes with the chat uh, for a little bit of AMA. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you to Kamar Daniel, tune in drop out uh, for paying your tuition. The rest of you stop grifting, um, pay your tuition. Uh, via Super Chats or Cash App, dollar sign, Hotep Jesus. And if you can't afford it, that's fine too. Uh, I'm glad everybody has this information because this is uh, what we're going to need to empower people. Um, shout out to Ryan Pugh, who sent me um, a Cash App for today's education. Thank you for paying your tuition, sir. You are highly appreciated. As you know, 99.9% um, .9 of the funds goes back into reinvesting into this platform as well as um, Hotep Nation. Renee Vogel said, um, shout out to Renee Vogel. He's um, produced some uh, wonderful flyer for us, digital flyer for our homeschooling initiative, hotepnation.com slash donate. He says, I remember hearing someone say that the Rizzo of Oz originally had a silver road, not a golden one. Really? Let's look that up. Hmm. So here it says, um, the yellow brick road represents the gold standard and the silver shoes or ruby slippers in a 1939 uh, film version represent the silverite 16 or the one silver ratio dancing down the road. Ooh, wow. <laughs> The city of Oz earns its name from the abbreviation of ounces, O-Z, in which gold and silver are measured. Wow, did not know that. Actually, I did hear about the gold standard um, for the Yellow Brick Road. I do recollect that, learning that at some point. But the O-Z um, representing um, ounces is, is uh, something new to me. Wow, interesting. Suggested in 1990 that the novel was an allegory about the demonetization. Oh, wow. So Hugh Rockwell suggested in 1990 that the novel was an allegory about the demonetization of 1873. Wow. Wow. I wish I'd have known this prior. So I would have included this in my book. I would include Well, it's included in the presentation now. It says, whereby the cyclone that carried away Dorothy to the land of Oz represents the economic and political upheaval. The yellow brick road stands for the gold standard and the silver shoes um, Dorothy inherits from the Wicked Witch of the East represents the pro-silver movement. 
When Dorothy is taken to the Emerald Palace before her audience with the wizard, she is led through seven passages uh, and up three flights of stairs. A subtle reference to the Coinage Act of 1873, which started the class conflict in America. Wow. Thank you, Renee Vogel. Wow. Wow. Chris Ryan says, does buying your book count as tuition? Absolutely, it does. Absolutely, it does. You should get a copy for yourself and research everything in there. It's, it was said they used silver to make the bullets for the Revolutionary War. Mm, interesting. Bro, mind is blown. Wow. Wow. The Wizard of Oz is literally about the subject I was talking about today. The Scarecrow represents the straw man. Thank you, True Onyx. Bro. Now I got more research to do. You guys just set me down a whole new rabbit hole. Now I want to be an expert on the Wizard of Oz and its relation to the gold standard. Um... This is why I love the chat. You guys just know so much. Um, matter of fact, why am I being stingy? Let's put this up on the screen. Let's just continue the presentation. <laughs> why not? Um, Cause this is just so interesting. This is a great way to spend our time and whoever left, you just totally missed out. You totally missed out. The Wizard of Oz and the Gold Standard. Uh, this is by Bharati Krishnan. Uh, I don't know how to say that. Uh, okay. So he says the coinage act of 1873 later condemned by some as the crime of 1873. See here. He even says it. Wikipedia. How you believe is about some bribe, but no, it's about. <laughs> wow. Was responsible for ending bimetallism in America, bringing forth the strict gold standard. This meant that the holders of silver bullion, couldn't have made their metal into fully legal tender dollar coins. The demonetization of silver was seen as one of the causes of the panic of 1873. We went over that a severe depression that hit America from 1893 to 1897 support for bimetallism was stewing in the 1870s and reached its pinnacle in 1896 campaign of William Jennings. Bryan. We'll be talking about this guy right here who is a national hero. We will be talking about him in future presentations. Please remember this name. This guy right here is a hero. Williams Jenny Bryan, a Democratic nominee for president. He actually lost, got shafted. Uh, he made his famous cross of gold speech at the Democratic National Convention where he passionately condemned the gold standard. Um, so the story had an elaborate allegory to the populist movement and commentary on the ongoing debates over the gold standard monetary policy of the times. The main and supporting characters, the Emerald City, Dorothy Shoes. They are famously ruby colored in the movie, but originally they were made silver in the book. Yellow Brick Road were all metaphors for different political and economic players. Dorothy follows Yellow Brick Road, the gold standard system, to reach the Wizard of Oz, President William McKinley, who turns out to be a useless fraud. Later, uh, she discovers that her silver slippers, the silver standard, the biomelic system, were her true saviors, and she uses them to get home. Hugh Rockoff, a president at Rutgers University, wrote a paper in 1990 titled The Wizard of Oz as Money Allegory, where he wrote the following. The cyclone that carried uh, Dorothy to the land of Oz represents economic, political upheaval. All right, we covered that. Uh-huh, uh-huh. The symbolism. Okay. Uh, so Scare Scarecrow is Western farmers, tin woodman, industrial worker. So tin woodman. Okay, so Dorothy is every American. The Scarecrow is represents Western farmers. Tin Woodman represents the industrial worker. And the cowardly lion represents a cowardly politician, perhaps William Jennings Bryan. Um, and we're going to you're going to we're going to go into William Jennings Bryan. Um, Toto represents the prohibitionist party. Also called uh, T totalers. What is that? A person who never drinks alcohol. Okay. 
Wicked Witch of the East, Eastern Factory, Owners and Industrialists, Wicked Witch of the West, the Trust. One popular solution to the Trust problem uh, was to dissolve them, as Dorothy does. Oz represents an abbreviation of the gold. Emerald City, greenback paper money exposed as fraud of the national capital system. The munch Munchkins, ordinary citizens. Wizard, President William McKinley. Yellow Brick Road, Gold Standard. Cyclone, political revolution of the free silver movement. Silver Slippers, the free coin jack. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a full and complete presentation. Uh, Wolfgang Amadeus, thank you. He said, copywriting 200-year-old music. What a bunch of Yahtzees. Yeah, like, think about that. Think about that. That's trash. She said the secret of Oz is a good documentary about it. Okay. Did you guys ever hear about the original version of, of, of Wizard of Oz? You can see somebody committing suicide in the background. I actually did go and watch and it does appear as though something happened like that. Did you guys ever hear about that? Anyway, today's presentation is straight from my book, uh, The Patriot Report, Unmasking Conspiracy of Money and War. Had I known The Wizard of Oz was related to this, I would have included it in the book. Renee Vogel, where were you? Where were you? Where were you when I was writing this book? We are all munchkins. The little guy. I can never watch that movie the same again. Oh, you guys he did hear about that. Okay, dope. Amazing discovery. The crime of 1873. What a, what a beautiful presentation today it was. It turned out much better than I thought it would. Let's see what's trending before we get out of here. Just in case the world has been hit with a cataclysmic event and we didn't know it. While we were sitting here watching Hotep Jesus speak. No, it doesn't look like we're missing anything. Kid Rock is now trending. Kid Rock has released an F-bomb-laced anthem that rips Dr. Anthony Fauci. Bug-19 policies includes a chorus of Let's Go Brandon chant in a protest against President Joe Biden and those who surround him. So, Kid Rock has a new song where he's grifting off of Let's Go Brandon. Very interesting. Shout out to Kid Rock. Doing God's work. A man is doing God's work. Freak Max says the midday show keeps getting better and better. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. Yeah, Munchkins are little people, aka, AKA us. When Nate Vogel said he was at home taking care of the kids. <laughs> well, I'm going to get out of here, man. Lay out, hotel and build.